Okay, uh, so we'll, we'll get going. Uh, first off, very uh, warm welcome to all the clients and friends who were able to join uh, for the webinar this evening, and uh, also to uh, Steve Soretsky. Uh, Steve is a thought leader on macroeconomics impact on the Canadian housing market, and uh, it's a real pleasure to have him join us today. If you do like uh, what you uh, hear today from, from Steve, be sure to check out his YouTube channel. He's been providing advice to me, many of my clients about the local market, uh, and I think he does a stand-up job. Uh, now, the, the goal of today's session is really to paint a picture for what is happening around the world, what's happening locally, and then what does that mean for your own financial planning and your own research with regards to buying uh, or selling real estate. Steve and I are both professionals. Uh, we're focused on researching and distilling facts to help our clients make smart decisions. Myself as an investment and insurance professional and Steve focused as a real estate professional. It's impossible for one person to know everything and hence why I'm bringing in subject matters I trust to keep clients informed. Throughout today's session, if you have any questions, you can uh, comment in the chat box and we'll get to them when uh, it's appropriate. And also just a reminder that this session will be recorded today. <clears throat> so what are we going to talk about today? Uh, really, it's the overall uh, economic situation, uh, COVID, central banks, uh, and how that's going to affect equity markets and the real estate market. Really, what uh, is happening is the, the rich are getting richer and the poor are uh, surviving with government handouts. The unemployment rate in Canada is currently sitting at around 9%, which is slightly recovered from just under 14% that we saw in April. Uh, however, still well above the full employment rate of around five and a half, six percent 6% that we had at the start of the year. I don't think any of us thought we'd be seeing the stock market rising like it has during a global pandemic. Most recent comparison we have to COVID-19 is the Spanish flu of 1918, where there was mass quarantine globally. But then our economies are not as intertwined as they are today. And that does include our central banks. The federal liberals, they forecasted a budget deficit of about $343 billion for this year, given all the COVID stimulus, which will put our national deficit over a trillion dollars. We haven't seen this kind of spending since World War II. No one argues that fiscal stimulus wasn't required, but the question of how we're going to pay this back continues to be a contentious question. Equity markets hit their trough on March 23rd, with some indices down by about 35% from their peaks, which we haven't seen since the 2008 great financial crisis. Central banks and governments acted swiftly to prop the economy up, announcing emergency measures and emergency money printing. Equity markets have largely recovered, although disproportionately to technology companies, save most of the FANG stocks, and uh, consumer discretionary goods, so say Walmart, P&G. Uh, transportation, entertainment is uh, continually uh, getting pummeled. Now, with Donald Trump uh, being uh, queued up against Joe Biden, it's really anyone's guess about who is going to be elected and how that's going to impact the global economy. Biden promises to tax the rich and focus on the environment. Trump will be less tax heavy and would likely continue deregulation to support his economic agenda. Uh, and of course, we're all on Zoom right now. Normally, I like to do these sessions in person, but given COVID, this is the scenario that, that we're all in. Uh, th this has been really the biggest destruction of wealth for many middle uh, income households in 2020, disproportionately those in service based or entertainment based industries. It's at anyone's guess how long the health measures will be in place, but if history paints a picture, we could very well be living our lives like this for at least another year. So when will normal happen? It's really anyone's guess. At the end of the day, the only uh, silver bullet is to have multiple income streams, a diversified portfolio, and to think long-term about your investment decisions. I'll now pass it over to Steve to talk a little bit about 
the housing market. Thanks for having me on. Um, I'm sure everyone is paying close attention to the housing market. Um, it's kind of everyone's fascination here in Vancouver. So, and and certainly a lot of wealth is is dominated in this in this asset class for Canadians, anyways. Um, so I think you know when the pandemic happened, everybody had this notion that, of course, you know things would crash. Um, I mean, CMHC came out. I was certainly the notion that we would see. Um, you know, a decline in house prices naturally when, when the unemployment rate uh, rises to levels that we haven't seen since World War II. Um, but again, through a lot of these uh, policy measures, that, which Brandon had mentioned earlier, um, that certainly helped offset at least some of the pain for now. Um, but what we can see is there's a couple trends that are developing uh, during this COVID era, one of them being Zoom that we're on right now, the other being a shift into detached single family houses and away and out of the condo market, basically people wanting more space. So what we can see here is uh, the number of detached homes. Uh, we had record sales for the month of September, um, as you can clearly see. So, I mean, when I talk about uh, record sales, I'm talking about greater Vancouver as a whole. Um, so that would be like the entire lower mainland. But what you can see is, uh, detached sales in greater Vancouver, uh, they were up 76, 76, 76 percent year over year in September uh, when you compare it to last year. Uh, again, as you can clearly see in the chart, last year maybe wasn't the best September, but it's kind of just to, to show you the rate of growth um, it is it has been quite substantial. Um, now, Brad, I don't know how we just flipped to the next chart here. Um, so this is greater uh, Vancouver detached inventory for sales. So basically what's happened is inventory levels have collapsed uh, for single family homes. What you can see there is the inventory levels um, each year for September. Um, so yes, sales are up 76, 76%, right? And people are saying, well, what, what about new listings? Um, obviously new listings have been increasing, um, but they're, they're still not enough to replenish the inventory. So right now you can see, uh, we actually had the lowest inventory levels in 15 years um, for single family houses. So when you talk, when you, when you hear the media talk about you know, a housing boom and record sales. Um, it's important to contextualize because there really is two different markets right now. You have the detached single family market, again, up 76% record sales, and then you have record low inventory levels. And you can imagine what that is going to do to the market. Uh, so if you want to hit the next slide there, uh, this is detached house prices on a year over year basis. Um, so you can actually see detached house prices uh, across Greater Vancouver are accelerating higher. Um, they were actually up 8% from last year. So, you know, I think it's important to understand or to, to kind of really think about this is I can't think of one person that had, had you pulled them in April and asked them, where do you think house prices will be in six months? I don't think one person would have told you that they would be up, you know, five, six, seven, you know, eight percent. I think everybody, even the most optimistic person in the real estate industry, probably would have told you that at best prices it would be flat. And in a more realistic scenario, they'll probably start to decline, uh, at least modestly. Um, that clearly hasn't been the case in the detached housing market. I would argue basically what's happened here is you've had not only consumer sentiment shift in terms of what they want to buy, but at the same time, um, you've had you know, so you had that and then you had the, the, the detached housing market was reopening. So we had low inventories to begin with. And then it reopened as it reopened in June, they had a wave of buyers that were scrambling to, to buy a house um, when inventory levels were low. So it kind of created this scenario where this pent up, this wave of pent up demand um, met um, a, a, a supply picture, which was, um, quite constrained and that's why you see rising prices. So if you want to flip to the next chart. Um, and this kind of shows you, I put this chart in because I, I wanted to highlight the fact that it, this is not like 2016. So 2016, if any of you remember, was a highly speculative market. We had a lot of offshore money coming in. Every single aspect of the real estate market was going up. It didn't matter if you bought a condo, a townhouse, a detached house, any which direction prices were going one direction and that was up. Everybody was speculating uh, on higher prices. We had rapid price growth. 
And what you can see here in this chart is it's the number of homes that were have been bought and resold within a 24 month period, basically homes that are bought and flipped. Um, so what you'll see is there was a sharp uptick in 2015 and into 2016 and parts of 2017 um, when we kind of had a lot of frothiness in the housing market. And then since then, the percentage has uh, collapsed really um, to below 4%. So a very small, what this basically is telling me is a very small chunk of homes are actually being bought and resold for the purpose of, of flipping. What we're seeing right now is basically um, a, a, a primary user driven market. So it's basically the people that were pent up at home for the past you know, couple months during COVID and they wanna get out and they need more space. They're working from home now. Um, they're, they're moving out to the suburbs. And so people, the people that are driving the market, it's an end user family oriented market. It's not this investor driven speculative market where everybody's trying to make a quick buck. Uh, so again, you flip to the next chart. Now this takes me into the condo market where we have a lot of um, investors playing in the market. Um, now you can see here that, okay, condo sales, yes, they actually hit a record high as well. And so, you know, most people say, wow, wow, every, every market is ripping. But I think this is more a, this is more symbolic of just the, the economy reopening. Um, where we had really just low sales from, you know, April, May, and June, which is historically our busier time of the year. So condo sales, yes, they were up um, in September. But if you flip to the next chart, Brandon, um, this will actually show you that look at the massive surge in new listings. This is not necessarily something we saw in the detached housing market. So new listings hit also hit record highs in September, um, really just dwarfing anything that we've ever seen, um, you know, in, in the month of September. So I think that this is ultimately creating, um, yes, you know, sales have been fairly robust in the condo market, but new listings are far surpassing that. And then if you flip to the next chart, um, this is where you can see condo inventory now has hit uh, it's a six year high um, or, or a five year high. So it's a five year high for greater Vancouver sales. So again, com compare that to the detached housing market where, as I just mentioned, you had a 15 year high in supply or sorry, 15 year low supply in detached single family inventory. And now you flip to the condo market and you have a five year high. Now remember pre COVID, the condo market was still quite active. We were seeing multiple offers. It was a very competitive market. So a lot has changed in just six months. Um, this is, we haven't seen a surge in condo inventory in a while. Um, so if you flip to the next page, um, another factor that um, I'm really keeping an eye on. So the condo market, we have a couple of factors that I think are going against it. Obviously there's some consumer sentiment shifts where people are wanting more space, you know, they're wanting their own front door, they're wanting to avoid the elevators, stuff like that. Maybe this is temporary during COVID. Um, but we also have the condo market is, is a lot of it is, is driven by investors. And, um, you know, as rents soften, which we're seeing, and as prices soften, which we're seeing, you know, it could spark investors just to say, you know what, let's just sell. And perhaps that's why we have a surge in new listings for September. And perhaps that's why inventory is rising. But the thing that maybe concerns me as well that I'd be looking for moving forward is a lot of new construction is currently underway. So we had a housing boom from 2015 to really 2017. And during that time, developers saw prices rising and that's when they actively started you know, launching new projects and building new new condos. And so a lot of those new condos now, as we can see, this is the number of units under construction. These condos are under construction and they are completing and they're, they're beginning to complete. And we're actually seeing record number of new completions as well. So that new supply that was, that pipeline that was basically started in 2015, that pipeline is now um, full. And, and it's full of new condos coming to the market at a time when you have a slowdown in rents, uh, you know, rent, rent price reductions, you have a weakness in the labor market, uh, which is predominantly impacting, you know, tenants, for example. Um, and so, and then you have a temporary pullback in immigration as well. So there's a lot of headwinds that I'm looking at in the condo market that I suspect, you know, could potentially be a catalyst, maybe, 
um, to start to drag down the detached housing market. Because again, you know, if condo prices slip too much, uh, it starts to impact people that want to climb the property ladder. So, you know, if condos decline and house prices, detached house prices continue to go up, that creates a wider gap and an inability to leverage and get in, uh, move up the property ladder. So this is something to watch for moving forward. Uh, but if you flip to the next slide, so this is obviously our, our population growth in Canada. Now, again, I would argue this is temporary, but I do think that population growth, you know, with a weak labor market will be restrained to some aspect because you can't pump in a whole bunch of immigration if there's no jobs for them. And likewise, it's, it becomes politically less palpable to ramp up immigration at a time when people are unemployed. Um, there becomes a, a sense of, uh, of resentment or anxiety towards that. And um, so I think that governments, whether they want to admit to it or not, I think that they're going to be forced to throttle back a little bit on immigration. And so this is what we can clearly see is population growth has slowed. Um, it actually slowed to its lowest pace of growth since World War II. So very similar to the labor market. So this is something worth keeping an eye on. Again, a lot of this depends on COVID, how long the recovery takes, how the labor market bounces back, but things that we're obviously keeping an eye on. Uh, you can flip to the next chart. And this is a popu quarterly population change in, in British Columbia. Um, so you can see here that, um, you know, temporary uh, people moving here, for example, we're seeing, uh, you know, work student visas, et cetera, that's actually turned, uh, turned negative um in the last quarter so this is something uh that we'll be again keeping an eye on and, and something that was was certainly helping the market before covid um but yeah again you know what's what's been supporting what's been supporting the real estate market i mean um for example this is a this is a pretty timely chart because what this is showing you this is the basically the bank of canada purchasing mortgage bonds basically buying mortgages essentially in simplistic terms, buying mortgages off the bank's balance sheets, which allows them to create liquidity to keep lending money. Um, so as long as, you know, as long as the banks have the ability to continue lending money and they're incentivized to continue lending money against real estate, obviously that provides a bit of a floor under, under home prices. And so this was basically the central banks, um, you know, key metric or key program that they use to create liquidity to ensure that people could still get mortgages to, to, to buy housing and to ensure that housing, you know, there would be continue to be housing sales. Um, so what we've seen across Canada, you know, it was announced today is across the nation. We saw in September, we saw record home sales across the nation. Um, we saw records, low supply, 2.6 months of inventory for sale. <clears throat> Um, and so, and we saw house prices up nationally, the home price index, which adjusts for composition of product selling home prices are up 10% in September on a year over year basis at all time record highs. So you have record sales, record prices again, and you would say, well, how is this possible during, you know, an economic recession, um, slash global pandemic, like everybody was expecting prices to fall. Well, I would argue that a lot of the fiscal measures brought in mortgage deferrals, but as well, this mortgage purchase program has certainly helped. And ironically, uh, the Bank of Canada just announced today at the same time is that they're actually going to be unwinding this program at the end of October. And so what that means in, in layman's terms is that this program basically was brought in to help it, it basically, in essence, what it does, this is a simplistic way of looking at it, but basically what it does is it helped to lower mortgage rates for one and number two, to help the banks to continue lending. So, you know, if you're wondering, you know, obviously mortgage rates are now down, you get a five year fix below 2%. Uh, a good reason of that is because of this program. So by the Bank of Canada now ending this program at the end of October, I don't think you're going to see too much volatility, but I do think that you could see a slight increase in mortgage rates here moving forward. Um, I don't think it's going to be anything drastic. Maybe it goes from 1.8 to 2% or something. You know, I don't think it's going to be anything significant. Uh, and I suspect that this program could very well be reintroduced 
um, you know, if there is some distress in the housing market, you know, if prices, if housing sales start to slow down and, and roll over and, and prices start to come off in a meaningful, in a meaningful way, I suspect that this program will be reintroduced. But uh, as of right now, again, these are things that are worth keeping an eye on. So I, yeah, I, I, in summary, that's, that's pretty much the gist of it. So if anyone has any questions, happy to answer them. Thanks, Steve. No, that was, uh, that was spot on. I think we do have, have a couple of quick questions come in. Uh, first off from Sam, his question to you is what would you say is the best area to buy in the lower mainland going into 2021? Um, bang, bang pers for buck. Yeah. Personal, personal opinion. Uh, I mean, happily, happy to debate this is I actually think that the Vancouver downtown condo market is, is, is selling off. I mean, the, like, Sales and there's hardly any sales happening downtown. Um, prices are down 10%. Maybe you know, I, I could easily see prices slipping further here in in, in the fall or in the winter. Uh, so you know, you could see you could see downtown condo prices down potentially. You know, say 15%. Um, it's not often that you see downtown or you know condo prices in, in the core of the city down. You know, 15%. Um, and so, and I personally believe that once this pandemic is over, I think that there will be a return. My personal view is there will be a return to, to, to the office, maybe not five days a week, but I do think a lot of these businesses, I mean, Amazon's launching massive amounts of new office space. I think they have 3000 jobs that they're filling downtown. Like, I just don't think that downtown, um, you know, I think right now there's a huge stigma because you know, much of the nightlife is shut down, offices are shut down, obviously the homeless population's got a little bit worse, but I think that once the city, once COVID goes away and uh, the city rejuvenates itself, I think that uh, it'll, be an, it'll be an opportunity for investors. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, that was uh, some, some great logic and I, I, would, I would certainly agree. It's a certain, it's a, people are not gonna hate living downtown forever, um, even though it might suck right now. Uh, yeah, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I kind of stag. Don't get me wrong; it definitely sucks right now. I mean, there's not a whole lot going on, and and it's certainly it's certainly gotten a lot worse. But I do think it will clean itself up, and I think that um, you know people that are, you know, we've seen people moving out to you know further out, say an hour, hour and a half, even people going buying you know cottages and stuff. I think that people are going to realize once they actually have to go back to the office that that you know that hour, hour and a half commute or whatever is just not as enticing as as maybe you thought it would be. Yeah, I've got uh, a couple of questions on my own, but we have a question that's come in from, from Ari. He says, Steve, I'm wondering why so many people are buying when there's so much uncertainty about the economy. Condo prices may most realistically fall by 10 to 20%. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Obviously, I have to sit there scratching my head as well, because I think like, you know, Brown, I think we've had this conversation too, is like, you know, as maybe, maybe we're too cautious or maybe we're, uh, yeah, maybe we're just too cautious, but I think like, you know, a lot of people, you know, you, you and, and myself, I think we were in the kind of like looking at it and saying, well, it's probably a good time to have some extra cash on the sidelines. Yes. You, you know, you want to deploy some of it in the stock market, obviously buying, you know, buying that huge sell off, but certainly doesn't help, you know, during an economic recession and probably some more volatility moving forward, probably helps to have a little bit more cash buffer. But what's been interesting is I think what we're seeing is people are actually upsizing uh, in a lot of cases and actually taking on more debt. So I think you have to have a lot of, you know, a confidence in, in your job or, or be just, you know, blind uh, confidence really. Um, but I think really, I think ultimately, I think my, my, I think the real answer to the question is, I think it kind of goes to show you how, emotion driven and, and, and sentiment driven that markets are like people are people are emotional beings and they're not necessarily rational people that are plugging things in spreadsheets you know people I think what happened was you think about the pandemic everyone was sitting at home everyone just realized like what their house was and they were spending so much more time and now everybody all of a sudden wants a bigger place they want to renovate the kitchen they want to put in a new bathroom and, and I think it's just like, it's like the emotions of people that are, are reprioritizing their, their, their living situation. Yeah. And everyone's situation is different. Everybody should be running their own cash flow uh, review, review their net worth, 
look at the full picture and what are the potential risks in their situation? Is their job as secure as they think it is? Um, is their wife's job as secure as they think it is? But the, the well, knock on, the yeah, knock go on, ahead. Sorry. Yeah, the knock on effects of this are, are, are extremely evident. Like my wife working as a, at a law firm, the number of divorce rates has actually gone through the roof because everyone's stuck at home more with their, with their partner. Um, totally. And I don't think people would have you know, foresaw that from a pandemic, but these sort of knock on effects that everyone's situation is different, do your own homework and make an informed decision based on facts, hopefully from listening to people like yourself and I who actually do the homework. Um, yeah, I think what is interesting is like, you just look, again, I always like focus and say, well, like what's happening during this you know, pandemic is like, one of the things that I think everyone is doing is everybody seems to be buying like a house in the suburbs and a, and a new dog. Right. It's just like, and that's just like pure emotion. Nobody's thought about like, will I want or have the time to care for this dog in a year or two? And will I, you know, people are buying like, you know, one, one area of the market that's booming is like, you know, vacation properties on the Gulf islands and, and uh, you know, the sunshine coast and this and that. And it's like, is that any, yeah, it's great right now because I'm sure everybody's got their laptop and they're working on, on Gibson's, but has anyone thought if, if, you know, in two years time, if they're going to be still doing that? Like, I just think it's, people are naturally, you know, short term mindset, right? Like it's just in the moment. Well, the stock market certainly would agree with you there, Steve. I think the, the reactionary effects that we see on that front or uh, a tweet from Donald Trump markets up or markets down. And I, I would, tend to agree that the average household tends to make decisions based on the short term. Um, totally. But chatting with guys like you or me will help them think about the long term as well. Uh, okay, Steve, I got one more question here from Daniel. He says, I just recently bought a condo looking to upgrade in the next five to seven years. Do you see the greater Vancouver real estate market continuing to climb long term or is affordability going to become more of an issue? Oof, man, <laughs> that's a tough one. Uh, I, I honestly, I don't, I don't know if I have an answer for that. I think like, I always think long term, like Vancouver is going to be, you know, it's a store, it's a store of wealth, and long term, you know, you're going to leverage these low, low mortgage rates to, to, you know, to build up equity in the housing market, and obviously as a principal residence, tax free. Um, so I think that's the real advantage. I'm, I've never been a fan of like telling clients, Hey, if you buy this, it will automatically go up, you know, 5% a year. Like we, we don't, you know, we don't know. Yes. Historically it's gone up. Uh, I just, my personal belief is, yeah, I think it will go up. Do I think that we're going to see the kind of returns that we saw, you know, over the last five, six years? No, I don't like, it's not normal. People just got so short sighted thinking it was normal that prices go up, you know, 15% a year in Vancouver. Like that's just not the case. Historically, they've gone up over the past 20, 25 years. You average it out, it's about 5% a year. Again, will we get 5% a year moving forward? I have no idea. Since Steve, this is a question on my end. What are you seeing uh, in terms of rental properties or the, the, the investors? Are you seeing investors kind of claw back and perhaps sell properties or are you seeing them just sort of bide their time and you know, I've, we've seen rents are coming down in some of the major cities. Has that impacted many people or uh, is it? Uh, kind of it's hard to say. I mean, we don't really have like good data on like, okay, well, who's selling? I mean, sure. A lot of it's anecdotal. I mean, I can't really say that I'm seeing landlords like running for the exits. I don't think that's the case at all. Um, obviously we're seeing more selling um, in the condo space. So I argue like maybe it only takes a small number of people to decide to Hey, if you've got three condos, maybe they're deciding to sell one of those, free up some extra cash. Like, and that's obviously what we're seeing in the new listing, the data there, and, and obviously inventory levels building. So I think that's a case. I mean, one of the markets that I look at is the pre-sale market because that tends to be very heavily driven by the uh, investor. Like they're predominantly, they're predominantly the the individual who, who, who funds these projects as investors buying pre-sales and that market's still really quite slow. So that kind of tells me that I just don't think investors are overly active right now in terms of purchasing. Uh, that's, that's fair. Uh, glad, glad to hear that there's still be some, that there's, it's mostly a primary market people looking to buy for, for uh, a place to live versus this speculation mania we had in say the 2015, 2016 timeframe. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think we definitely have to look beyond the headlines right now because I think it's, 
there's a lot more to the story right now as opposed to just record sales record you know prices it's like if you really start to unpack it it's uh it's a very much um it's an interesting market let's, let's put it that way so i think you know it, it's We'll have to wait and see what the next sort of six months look like. I think as these deferrals start to expire and everything, it's, it's much too soon. I know people are obviously kind of like, you know, giving CMHC a really hard time and saying, well, your forecasts were terrible. You, you know, you called for nine to 18% decline and, and prices in Canada are hitting new highs. And obviously that's, that's quite embarrassing for your national, you know, mortgage housing agency. But um, again, I think that in terms of, in terms of foreclosures and, and supply and stuff, I think that, you know, we'll see more of that in, in 2021. Um, so we'll have to see if the economy can bounce back to kind of fill some of that, you know, that void. Yeah. I feel bad for Evan Siddall. The guy's just trying to, to do, to do well among Canadians, but uh, the central banks, uh, Tiff Macklin don't seem to agree with that. They keep rates at the floor and everyone borrows and all the speculators will just enjoy the debt buffet. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you can imagine a scenario where, you know, maybe this central bank didn't intervene in the mortgage market, and maybe, uh, you know, people didn't get two thousand dollars SERB checks. Like, you know, what the what the housing market would look like. So, again, obviously, a lot of the future direction depends on policy measures. Um, so, I think with with record prices and record sales, they might be inclined to scale back some of that stimulus which again i think they have with the with the bank of canada's announcement today well, we're, we're lucky to have the tech community in vancouver and have a lot of that expansion from those big big companies down south investing here uh but we look at say calgary and, and edmonton they don't necessarily have that to the extent that we do um what, what do you think about those markets i mean i i think i mean yeah you can see like deferrals are running the highest in alberta across canada right so Unfortunately, their labor market's just been kind of beat up over the last, you know, five years. Um, I think from a affordability standpoint, I actually think it's a pretty attractive place to potentially put some money. You know, I, I don't know. Is it, is it, I, everyone has different trains of thought on that, but like my view is like, it's a pretty stable market. I mean, you know, you probably don't get massive price appreciation or price increases but for the most part the prices are pretty stable and the rents are pretty stable and people are still moving there um, i think population growth in alberta or at least in, in calgary is actually higher than vancouver so yeah i mean it's just it's a tougher labor market now but i think eventually you know let's just put a hypothetical scenario if, if vancouver toronto montreal and ottawa just keep going up at the pace that they are there will be no nowhere else <laughs> nowhere else to go if you want to buy a house yeah Everyone's going to get to enjoy a real Canadian winter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, Steve, I, I really do want to thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, thank you to all the attendees that have joined. If there's any final questions, feel free to chime in now. Um, otherwise, this uh, session is going to be distributed uh, on, on YouTube and shared with, uh, with all the registrants. So uh, if you do have feedback on this session or if you have ideas for what you'd like to see in the future, please do let me know. Uh, Steve, any final comments from you, my friend? No, man, it was good. Uh, yeah, I think people should, uh, you know, hit you up for advice. I think that, uh, you know, between the two of us, it's kind of, yeah, long, longer term picture. It's, it's definitely a tricky market to navigate. So, I mean, I think that you kind of lean on, on people that you trust and yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and that's the reason why I'm doing sessions like this with, with uh, Steve and, and other professionals is, everybody should have people in their corner that are doing some of the homework. You don't have to do it all yourself. It's really impossible to know everything and leveraging professionals like Steve or myself or whoever else you work with, that's going to help you make the right decision at the right time and not be one of those people that's uh, over leveraged or needs to foreclose because they didn't do the proper planning. Yeah. I think it's just like, obviously finding someone that you, you know, you can trust so you can help, you know, I think you need to filter out the noise, right? There's so much like, so many headlines coming out right now about like, you know, stock market or the real estate market or what's going to happen. Everyone's trying to forecast. And like, I think these are uncertain times. So you kind of have to, I think you have to lean on people that you trust. And I think trust is a, is a really valuable asset. So I, I don't, so not something I take lightly and uh, I know that you don't either. So. Definitely. Beautiful. Okay. Well, uh, Steve, thanks again. Thanks to all the attendees and uh, we'll see everyone on the, on the next session, which will likely be next month.
uh, and keep your eyes on LinkedIn for that. Awesome. 